running a YouTube channel, one thing that always kind of gets to me is when I have someone that says, hey, I have this problem with my appliance. I've gone in and bought these parts to fix it, and it didn't fix the problem to the unit. And then I'll ask them, well, how do you know that was what was actually wrong with the unit? Did you test it with a multimeter? And more often than not, they say, well, I don't own a multimeter, but I just figured that since your video showed you replacing this after testing it, I may as well replace it. And very often we find out that the part wasn't actually bad. They've gone out, they spent money. Maybe they end up returning the part, screwing the business over. So I wanted to show you how to use a few different types and styles of multimeters at my desks. One fun thing about running a YouTube channel is everything's fake. I have this background behind me. I have this desk here with these multimeters, but the reality is there's a warehouse literally right behind my camera. Um, because there's a big warehouse, I'm going to go behind the camera and start grabbing a bunch of parts. And I want to show you how to test various things at my desk here. And then we'll do some uh, stuff plugged in as well that's a little bit more dangerous and fun. So let's go ahead and start grabbing some parts. I'm going to show you how to use some multimeters. Okay, now that I have all my tools and a bunch of multimeters, let's go over what a multimeter does. A multimeter simply allows you to test the electrical signal between two points and figure out if an electrical signal can happen or not. That's at least the easiest way that I could explain it. This is my first multimeter I've ever bought, and it's lasted, I think, six years, and it cost about 30 bucks uh, and it's lasted all this time using it for all these years. It's not a very large investment, but there's all kinds of different modes. The big one you're going to typically use is this one here that shows your like a little, almost like a Wi-Fi signal or something like this arrow you can see on the second camera. This is for your continuity. And all you're doing generally when you use this is you're taking your electrical whatever and seeing if you can get a signal from point A to point B. You put your leads in, which will be of different sizes, and just seeing if it changes on your digital readout or your analog readout, or in the case of something somewhat moderate, a tone. That sound means that, yes, you can get an electrical signal from one lead to the other. Now, if whatever part is theoretically broken, then it's not going to get a signal unless the resistance is like super high and we'll, we'll get to those in a minute. And we're going to start with continuity, which is the probably the most prolific one you're ever going to use. So let's get to testing uh, quite a few real world things that I have over here to the side. I have a Samsung thermal fuse here for a refrigerator. This is a thermal fuse that would stop working altogether if your refrigerator overheated and if it overheated it's a safety feature to make sure that your refrigerator doesn't catch on fire or blow up but if it pops you're not going to get a signal now on something like this it's outside of the refrigerator you have the connection that would go in here to do and this is your pro tip is that if you don't think the leads are going to fit in the front fit them in the rear like reminding my wife of that sometimes too so you'll take your leads You'll put them in on the rear side where the metal connections are, and you, we should, at least I think we should get a signal. Oh, we will get a signal. Now, it's beeping, and depending on the device, the continuity setting also acts as resistance, and we'll get a number here. Usually on most things, that number, if it's a sensor, is really a really, really low number. Spe some specialty sensors have a high number. Other sensors will have a variable number, and that just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Different sensors have different reasons for existing. This is a pass or fail sensor, meaning if it can pass electric through, everything's fine. If it fails because something bad has happened, it's just not going to work, and you need to find the, the replace this and then find the problem. But without the multimeter, you wouldn't know that this was in fact a problem at all. We don't sell a lot of these, but when we do sell them, it's because someone finally figured out this was the part that was broken. You could go in and replace the defroster or a bunch of different things, and this be the only thing that's wrong. Another really big one that people test a lot are heating elements. And I have a gigantic Samsung heating element here. And, and elements are definitely one of the biggest problems because often people go in to replace everything, which can be very expensive when it could just be one thing. And we have here a gigantic Samsung element. 
It has two sensors on it and then two speed connectors for the heating element. So what we're gonna do is go through and test these. And these are very simple, but very common to have certain things fail on them. And let's use this multimeter. On these types of units, you have the sensors that will run on continuity and then the heating wire that's going to run off continuity and a resistance rating. Another thing to always do is when you're testing and you're actually in a unit, make sure that at least one of the spade terminals is off because otherwise you don't want the signal to get back fed into another area on the device. You only want to test what's right here. This one should give us a reading somewhere of 0.00, .00 but it won't be OL. OL means that there's an open line, which, you know, it's not getting a connection right now this very second, meaning that there's something impeding a signal. And there we get 0.01. .01. So that one's good. And then come over here. This won't get back fed since it's isolated by itself. And you have 0.0, .0 there. And then we're going to go over to the element itself. And we should get, uh, we're getting 11, 11 uh, ohms of resistance there, which is about what you want. A heater element like this would get about 10 to 20. And the idea is if there's a coil on the inside of this that's somehow broken, then you're not going to get a signal through the multimeter. Somewhere on the inside, theoretically, maybe a coil could be broken. And if that's the case, then it would show up on the multimeter that is in fact broken. I would take my wire strippers and cut it just to demonstrate, but this is like a $70 element and I don't... Eh, let's go ahead and break it real quick. Let's re remember that I love you guys. So here's what we're going to do. We got a signal on this. We got some amperage. I'm going to go ahead and take my wire clippers and I'm going to go ahead and do it, rip it from this side. Hopefully you guys can see this. I'm destroying an element on camera. I'm going to cry afterwards, but... You can see it, got this wire here. I'm gonna go and clip it. So we've broken the end canal wire. It is not working anymore. YouTube pays me a fee to do some of these videos. So there's gonna to be tons of listings for all these multimeters. Um, and if you need any of these things, uh, make sure to check out the shopping page. But you can see that the wire is now totally shot on the inside. It's totally dislocated. Like if something happened that it melted. And again, we have an open line here. We should continue to get an open line now that the internal element has been severed. And we are, of course, getting nothing. Zero, there's an OL, meaning that there's no connection. Now, one reason I did sever this that um, I wanted to show you is sometimes you can get a rare instance on these heating elements to where the wire has disconnected on the inside. It's broken but it's not, instead of it touching the wire, it's touching the element itself and it comes into what you'd call a grounding situation. Um, let's take this wire. I'm going to bend it against the chassis on the inside. Okay, so the wire on the inside is now bending and it's actually touching the cabinet. There's an electrical connection now between the wire going to the cabinet. What happens? I kind of know what will happen, I kind of don't. So we're going to go back here, test the leads. What happens? Oh, well. Now we're not getting a signal from the wire, from this side of the wire to this side of the wire as well. The harnesses won't touch. But what we should be able to do is move and try to see if we can get a signal here on the spade connector, meaning one side's connected to the wire, and then go to the cabinet of the heater can, and we should get a connection. Or at least I think we should get a connection. Let's see. Yep, there we go. Now we are getting a connection on the wire going from the wire harness to the cabinet itself. This would be a situation where the wire is grounding out, and this can be very, very dangerous. You can get heat running through the element, even if it's not supposed to. It can cause uh, the sensors to burn out as a safety switch. You'd only figure this out if you physically looked at it or tested with a multimeter. So again, we've grounded out the wire on the inside, um, and we were able to get a connection when we touched the spade terminal to the cabinet, but we weren't able to get a connection touching spade to spade on the multimeter. So that's a very dangerous situation on why you want to have a multimeter. Um, you know, if you replace the unit, you'd be okay, but what if you just went in and replaced the sensors when you needed to replace the element? 
and vice versa a lot of times people will buy the heating element when it's just the sensors and the sensors may be all of $25 whereas the whole heater canister could be anywhere from 70 to $150 OEM and it's not a matter of trying to make you pay a lot more money for the multimeter it will end up saving you a lot of money very often now let's go to something else real quick those were tests that you would just use for continuity with and without the alarm. The other thing that you want to look out for is resistance. If you're running something, let's say with a motor, not only does do you need to have continuity, it needs to have a certain resistance telling you that the coil is wound properly. And if the resistance is too high or too low, it's considered what we call out of spec and chances are it's not going to work properly. I have a brand new Samsung drain pump here by ERP and it has two basic leads in it. Now I'm going to use my Klein, well it's not my Klein, the CO130 that I stole off of Jeff this morning and we're going to turn it to the horseshoe with the beep and we're going to see what the amperage is. Clearly it's going to be a good value but then it can vary from uh, item to item. I think a drain pump like this should run about 60 ohms is about what I'm thinking it should. Thirteen point eight. If I'm if I'm reading it upside down, it's about thirteen point eight, which I'm going to assume is right. Sometimes numbers can change a little bit depending on how solid the connection is, and I'd have to check the spec on this to know. But I'm going to assume that's right because it is brand new from ERP. A lot of times, the resistance matters a lot on uh, certain objects, especially sensors like this. The big thing about sensors like this is you're passing voltage through it or current through it. And depending on how hot or cold this little plastic piece is, the metal in it expands and contracts, changes the resistance in it, and then the computer uses that information to decide if it's too warm, too cold, or just right. Let's put our leads in the rear. So right around, we are getting right around 5,000 ohms, which is exactly what you want on this kind of sensor. This is a nearly universal defrost sensor from Samsung. The secret is GE, I think LG, and a few other companies use the same identical sensor. And what happens is as the temperature changes around us and it changes on the sensor, this number will go up and down. And that's how it knows exactly what the temperature is. You could put this in some ice cold water and it would uh, increase significantly. You put it in your hand, my hand is warmer than the air around us, and that number is going to keep dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And what happens here is if the sensor is considered off spec because it's going bad, the, the, the metal is corroding or damaging or something's wrong with it, what's going to happen is instead of it being, say, 30 degrees on the inside and it needs to keep running the heater to defrost the ice and rip it off, what if it's off spec and it thinks that it's 80 degrees and it can't run because there's a safety hazard. Well, then you wouldn't get that defrosted and you have a big ball of ice and it would be a huge problem. And that's why you would have to check and make sure that this is on spec. And if you're smart about this, like a, a technician would, you would could test these things from the control board on the back of the unit, uh, wherever all the wires come in and go out at, instead of inside the unit taking the cabinet off. But we have all these parts here by themselves that we can test individually. Uh, Samsung dryers, every brand dryer has a thermistor to it. And the thermistors on the dryers are identical. These two parts are identical. Um, there's a very, very small, very, very small piece in it that uh, is the bimetal strip. And this one should have a different uh, value. It's not going to be based on 5,000 ohms um, at, temp at normal temperature. At least I don't think so. It's 10,000 ohms. But the same principles are going to apply here. This is inside the dryer, and it's going to tell you if the dryer's too hot, just right, and it will send a signal wherever it needs to go. I'm going to place my finger on that bimetal, and then it's going to rapidly, rapidly, rapidly drop which sends the signal, hey, it's warming up, it's getting too hot. So it's dropped uh, 1,700 ohms in the process. I'm going to take my finger off, delay it a little bit, and it's going to go back up. That uh, metal strip is going to get cooler, 
and that number is going to drop. If I put my finger on it, it should get warmer and that number is going to go down. And that's how all these sensors work. You think that they're some sort of really, really intelligent, smart, sciencey thing, but it's just a bit of metal with some metallurgy and some science to it that changes the values, and that's how things work, or they don't look right depending on what's going on. Now in my studio, I have this good working Amana stove, but let's go up behind it and look at the electricity and some of the things that can happen in some scenarios. Now at the rear of a working stove, the reason that you'd want to use your multimeter and test live voltage is to make sure that the wire going to the plug, going to the breaker actually works. And if there isn't an issue here, you could go in and try to fix a work, good working oven that doesn't heat because there's an issue somewhere starting here going back. What you would do is you take your multimeter, switch it to the voltage AC, which is the little squiggly line, and rather than the straight line and dots, which is DC voltage, which is a lot for PCBs, and you would use your two leads to press them against the various posts to get your voltage. Now, the big thing here is you absolutely want to use your leads, not your fingers, because if you touch your fingers here, you become part of the circuit, which is a really, really bad idea. So on something like this, you'd use your gloves and then you would use your multimeter and use the two leads to test the side posts, which should get 240 volts and then the middle and left, middle and right to make sure that there is the correct voltage. And at least in the US, these are the right numbers that you would want to have for a stove like this. If something happened that a line was bad, you may get 120 on one side, but not on the other. And remember, voltage only shows you what the potential value is between two of the posts or two, the, the lines. It doesn't show the actual current going through it at that time, it's only the potential. The amperage setting on this, which would be the 2 slash 20 or the 200 slash 400, that would test the actual electricity consumption or current going through it at any one given time. And that would be super helpful to see if there's an issue with a igniter or other object. So let's go through and discuss that as well. The first example of using an amp clamp is for gas stoves that don't heat properly. It's possible that the igniter could glow and act like it works, but it actually does not. Underneath, there's a safety valve and a warming drawer that operates the gas in tandem with an igniter. To use the amp clamp on something like this, you turn the multimeter to the A symbol, and on the appliances, it's always on the lowest range of amps, usually between 2 and 20 amps. Next, you would turn the device on and see what the meter says. One key thing to note is the amp clamp only can go on one single wire. You can't, for example, put it on a power cord that has both a hot and a neutral as they would cancel each other out. So the wires have to be absolutely separated with only one inside the clamp itself. For example, on this gas stove, you need three amps for the valve to open to feed gas to the stove because that's how much it takes to actually ignite natural gas or propane. Now, since it's not hitting three amps, it's going to glow and work, but it's not going to ignite because there's no gas going to the stove. Another example that you can use an amp clamp on is for refrigerators with low Freon. If you can locate a single wire going to the compressor and put your multimeter on it, the hotline will show you exactly how much work the compressor's motor is doing. The amperage needed to properly compress refrigerant varies from model to model, but generally the higher the better. And if you know the number, you can tell if the compressor is actually running internally properly or it's not running enough, telling you that there is a problem with the refrigerant. These are all the ways you can use a multimeter. It's important that you have one and know how to use one. I hope these examples help you and give you some good ideas on how to use one. And again, if you need to buy one, I will have links in the description for a few different types that we used in this video. Have a great day.